name is Steve Iriki. I'm an instructor in the business department. One of the things I teach is business ethics. So Sue and Stacy asked me to do this presentation about Elizabeth, who I understand you guys have been studying in first year experience. So you're familiar with who she is and Theranos and all that. So I'm not going to go over that. Uh, this is just a picture of Theranos' old corporate headquarters in Silicon Valley. So, why, let me first of all start with a question. Why is business ethics important? Why, why am I even giving this discussion? Well, first of all, let's start with unethical business practices. And uh, if you are, are a firm, an organization, a business engaged in unethical business practices, there can be all kinds of ramifications. First, it can cause legal problems for you, right? Businesses and their employees that act unethically in ways that break the law could face f criminal sentences and fines and penalties. Within the last 20 years, we've seen numerous examples of that. Uh, think people like the uh, leaders at Enron, Tyco, MCI WorldCom, uh, Bernie Madoff are all business leaders who broke the law and ended up in jail. So obviously that can happen. Another ramification is, is it can lead to poor employee performance. Just imagine if you're working for a company that you don't like what they're doing. You think what they're doing is unethical, unseemly, you don't feel comfortable about it. You're not going to work hard for that company, right? You're not going to get in at 6 in the morning and stay 12 hours and work hard for that company. You just not going to be feel committed to that company. So it's going to lead to poor employee performance. Another ramification is it's going to tarnish the reputation of the firm, the organization. Recent example of that is Wells Fargo. A few years ago, Wells Fargo, it turned out to boost their numbers. Employees at Wells Fargo would create phony accounts on behalf of customers because Part of their compensation was tied to how many new accounts were opened. So they created fictitious accounts that their customers didn't even know about. Naturally, this led to a big uproar. The CEO was fired. And that tarnished their reputation and is still with them today. It's still uh, punishing them. It's affecting their profits, et cetera, et cetera. The last thing is that if you have an unethical business, it'll affect your bottom line, right? There are companies that, you know, did things so horribly that they had to close their doors, right? And uh, e even if you're able to stay open, you're going to lose customers. Who wants to do business with a firm that engages in, you know, in unethical conduct, you know? So, now let's continue on. Let's look at the flip side of this. Let's say you're a really ethical business, right? You try, try to make an effort to uh, treat your employees right, treat your stakeholders right, make a difference in the world. What benefits do you get from that? Well, a number. First of all, you motivate and inspire your employees. Your employees feel good about working for a company like that, right? They, they look after you, they take care of you, they compensate you well, they do other things that you feel good about. You're going to feel good about working for a company like that. The other good thing is that it's going to raise the standing of the firm, right? If you engage in practices that try to help the community, help the environment, et cetera, et cetera, you know, that's going to get good publicity for the business. The other thing is that it's going to satisfy your stakeholders. Stakeholders, what I mean by that is all the people that the business or the firm uh, have come in contact with, uh, people like customers, suppliers, shareholders, employees, the, uh, the community that the business is located in. They're all stakeholders, and they'll benefit and appreciate an ethical business. The last thing is, and there's some studies that have shown this. It'll really help the business's bottom line. There are some people, some customers, and this is, I think, becoming more important, really 
focus on whether the business in their mind is ethical. Do they treat their employees well? Do they try to make a difference in the world? And there are, that attracts customers. Okay, so it can really enhance the business's profitability. Now, let's turn to Elizabeth. Very interesting person. First of all, her background. Uh, she was born in February of 1984, so right now she's only 36 years old. Her father is Christian Rasmus Holmes IV, and her mother is Noel Ann. This is a picture of her father. What's interesting is that Elizabeth's father was a vice president in Enron. Enron, I don't know if you're familiar with, is one of those unethical businesses that, as it turns out, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, they were inflating their revenue. They were making it up. And eventually they got caught, they went bankrupt, uh, several of their leaders went to prison, the CEO and president were convicted in federal court and sentenced. Now, I can't find any evidence that her father was involved in any, any of this criminal conduct or knew about it. So I'm not saying he was. But it's just kind of interesting that he used to work at Enron. Afterwards, he worked for various government agencies, including USAID, which is uh, where this photo was taken. Now, I know you guys have been studying about Elizabeth. One thing I found that was interesting is that uh, she grew up in Washington, D.C. and Houston. But what is interesting is she was, and this is not surprising, uh, very determined and uh, individual. And even as a child, she insisted on seeing things through completion. For example, one of her favorite games was Monopoly. And we've all played Monopoly. I assume you all play Monopoly, right? And when you play Monopoly, at a certain point, it's apparent someone's going to win, right? They have most of the hotels, they have most of the properties, they have Park Place, right? And so at that point, you just say, okay, let's call the game. You know, Steve or Billy or Susie's going to win. Well, Elizabeth wouldn't have that. If she were winning the game, she would insist that they played the game to the end. She wanted to play the game until she owned all the properties and had all the hotels and everyone else had no property or no money. She wouldn't let the other people quit. So this is kind of an interesting aspect of Elizabeth. Now, as you guys probably know, she was admitted to Stanford University. This is a picture of Stanford. It's a very prestigious private university in Silicon Valley in California. She began her studies in 2002 as a chemical engineer. And after her first summer, she worked for a laboratory in which she tested for acute respiratory syndrome. And the way they would test for this is they would have to collect vials of blood samples. And I think she found this practice kind of unpleasant, messy, and she didn't like it. And I think this gave her the idea for Theranos. And while she was still at Stanford, Elizabeth came up with the idea of creating blood tests that would only require a few drops of blood. One of her professors, Phyllis Gardner, who's a professor of clinical pharmacology, who's pictured here, told Holmes at that time that the idea wasn't feasible. She said, given the current technology, it just couldn't be done. But Elizabeth wouldn't listen to her. So what Elizabeth did, she was very determined, as you know. She founded a company called Real Time Cures, which was later renamed as Theranos. And Theranos is a combination of therapy and diagnosis. So that's how she came up with the name. In 2003, Elizabeth dropped out of Stanford she used her tuition money to help fund Theranos. Holmes and Theranos began to raise money from wealthy investors and venture capitalists. Elizabeth, as you probably know, she was a great admirer of the late Steve Jobs of Apple. So what she did is she adopted his black turtleneck look. And in photos that you see of her, she's almost always wearing this black turtleneck.
All right. By December of 2004, so just a couple years after she left Stanford, Elizabeth had raised $6 million to fund Theranos. Six years later, Theranos had raised more than $92 million in venture capital. And in 2014, Elizabeth was named one of America's richest women by Forbes magazine. And Theranos had an estimated value of $9 billion, which is just mind boggling. Now, there's a couple quotes here that are kind of interesting. This one, the top one's very famous. A fool and his money are soon parted. This other quote is interesting. And I'll, I'll, I'll expand on this. This is from her former professor at Stanford who told her the idea of Theranos was impossible. And Professor Gardner said that old men, the brains go to their groin. What do I mean by that? Why is that important? I'm not trying to be lewd or coarse or crass, but it is important for a reason. Now, this is a uh, photo of some of the board members of Theranos. This isn't the complete board. This is just some of the board. But look at this board, how impressive this board is. I've looked at boards of other companies like Apple and Boeing. I've never seen a high-powered board of directors like this. I mean, you have Henry Kissinger, who was Secretary of State under President Nixon's and Ford. George Soltz, he was Secretary of State under President Reagan. James Mattis was Secretary of Defense under Donald Trump. Sam Nunn is a former U.S. Senator. Uh, Richard Kovacevic is the former CEO of Wells Fargo Bank. David Boies is a famous attorney. He's argued cases in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. Riley Bechtel is the former CEO of Bechtel Corporation, which is one of the largest engineering firms in the world. And William Perry is a former Secretary of Defense. So it's a very impressive board, very powerful. But it's very interesting. Elizabeth, from what I can tell, took a great interest and spent a lot of time recruiting board members. All right, so most, if not all, of these board members she personally recruited and wanted to get. So let me ask you a question. What strikes you about this board? Anything strike you about this board? Other than they're very powerful and rich men. But what strikes you about this board? Anybody? They're old? I agree. Anything else? All men. All white men, yeah. I think Elizabeth did that intentionally. I mean, you look at this board, it's all old white men, right? You don't see any women. You don't see any racial minorities. You don't see any young people. You don't see any people with medical backgrounds or background in pharmacology or lab testing. You don't see any scientists. Most of them are either politicians or former government officials. A couple of them have business backgrounds, but certainly no background in, in medicine or anything like this. I think Elizabeth chose this board, and I'm kind of dovetailing on what Professor Gardner said, that quote in the earlier slide, she chose a board that she knew she could control and manipulate, right? She knew what her strengths were. She was very bright, even cunning, I would say. And I'm not trying to be sexist or anything like that, but she, she knew that with this board, she could control them, right? They probably spent board meetings, uh, you know, glaring at Elizabeth rather than asking really important, hard questions. So this is kind of interesting. And it comes, I'll show you later on why this is so important. Questions? All right. Elizabeth and Theranos came up with a prototype machine depicted here, which it claimed could conduct hundreds of different tests using only a few drops of blood. As you can see, it's a very small machine that could be easily transported. If you look at your conventional blood testing machine, it's like the size of a, of a copier, a pretty big copier. It can't be transported. Elizabeth's idea was you could 
Just take a few drops of blood, put it in the machine, and you could transport this machine almost anywhere. Right? It didn't have to be in a lab. It didn't have to be in a hospital. You could go out in the field. As long as you had access to electricity and whatnot, you could set up the machine. So it would, it would have been a revolution in blood testing if it had worked. Now, in reality, though, the machine could only perform a limited number of tests with varying degrees of accuracy. Now, let's talk about the fall of the firm. In October 2015, Wall Street Re Journal reporter John Carreyrou published an investigation in which he found that Theranos' technology didn't work and that most of the te test results came from using traditional third-party machines. What Theranos was doing is, let's say you were a prospective investor. You would visit their headquarters. They'd show you the machine. They'd take a few samples of blood, a few drops of your blood, and they, they would pretend to put it in the machine, and then they would go continue on with the tour of their headquarters, right? They would show you the other floors and serve you lunch, and a couple hours later, they would come back and show you these test results, you know? They'd show you, you know, what your cholesterol was and this and that, and they'd have 50 different results. The problem is, is they would take that blood sample they took from you, and put it not in their machine, but a conventional blood testing machine. So they were lying. They were deceiving people into believing that the machine worked. It didn't work. So remember, this article came out in October of 2015. What happened afterwards? Well, the federal government, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Service, and the FDA began to conduct an investigation into the firm. In July 2016, so just a few months after that article came out, the federal government banned Holmes from the lab testing industry for two years. In late 2016, the company shut its clinical labs and had to lay off 340 employees. And then finally, in September of 2018, the firm had to close its doors completely. The company at its height had more than 800 employees, so they all lost their jobs in the end. Now, let's talk about Elizabeth and the consequences for her. Uh, Holmes was the target of several lawsuits by former investors, business partners, and patients. She was, for example, sued by some of the former board members we saw. Uh, Richard, uh, the CEO of Wells Fargo, Richard Kovacevic, he gave Theranos, for example, $4 million of his own money. And he lost that, so he turned around and sued the company. In March 2018, Holmes settled with the SEC and agreed not to hold an officer position with a public company for 10 years. And then finally, on June 14, 2018, Holmes was indicted for fraud in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California in San Jose. That's a federal court. This is actually the face page of the indictment. It doesn't really look like a legal document, does it? It looks really messy. But what it is is you can see Elizabeth's name. You can see Sunny Balwani. That's her former lover and the former president and chief operating officer of Theranos. They were both indicted. They were indicted on 11 different counts of wire fraud and conspiracy to commit wire fraud. And you can see this was signed by the judge. Initially, she, no bail was set. So this is the indictment against her. And just for your information, San Jose, if you look at Silicon Valley, at one end is uh, San Francisco, at the southern end of Silicon Valley is San Jose. So that's where this was filed, in San Jose. Now, this is a, a page from the indictment. I wish you could see it a little bit better. But these are six of the counts against Elizabeth and Sonny. So she's charged with wire fraud. What wire fraud is, is if you use email or a telephone or um, a in the old days a telegram 
you use some kind of electronic or wire transmission to commit fraud against somebody, or you get money from them through an electronic bank transfer. That is wire fraud. It is a federal crime. For each count of wire fraud, Elizabeth and Sonny could get up to 20 years in federal prison. All right, now, let's look at this a little bit. Count three, she, she and Theranos got almost $100,000 from one investor. Count four, she got over $5 million. Count five, she almost got $5 million from investor number two. Count six, she got over $38 million from one investor. Count seven, she got almost $100 million from an investor. Can you imagine if you're that investor? Finally, count eight, she got almost $6 million. So, among other things, Holmes and Sonny are accused of defrauding investors of more than $150 million. Now, just a little information. Currently, her case is scheduled to go to trial in March of 2021. That might be continued because of COVID. This is actually the courthouse in San Jose where her trial will take place. Her case will be tried before the Honorable Edward Davia, U.S. District Judge. Judge Davia was appointed by President Obama. Prior to serving as a federal judge, he was a state court judge in California. Prior to that, he was in private practice, small practice in the, in the San Jose area. Now, and that's a, a picture of the judge, by the way. Now, it's interesting to see and try to discern what Elizabeth may raise as a defense. I mean, the case against her, I'm no criminal law expert, but the case against her seems pretty good, pretty strong, right? She uh, misrepresented the fact that the machine worked. She also misrepresented the revenue of the company. She told investors, a lot of investors, that the company uh, was making millions and millions of dollars, and in fact it was making very little money. And she lied about the fact that the machine could produce, uh, worked and could do hundreds of tests when in fact that wasn't true. So the case seems pretty good. Now, what's interesting though is that in recent court filings, uh, Holmes' attorneys have indicated that they may raise her mental health as a defense. What that means is they're alleging that she has some condition, some psychological condition or something like that, where she didn't fully understand or appreciate what she was doing. As a matter of fact, they've hired a defense expert, a, a therapist, and the therapist uh, expertise is, her area of expertise deals with studying how women react to different kinds of trauma, whether it be physical or emotional trauma, and their response to that trauma. So it'll be an interesting uh, situation to see what Elizabeth's counsel raises as a defense in her criminal trial. The other defense or tact they may take as well is they may try and blame her co-defendant, Sonny. They may say, well, I didn't do anything, Sonny did it. And as it turns out, Sonny and her are actually having separate trials. So Sonny actually won't be in the courtroom when Elizabeth is tried. So that's a possible viable defense. We'll see if it works. Questions so far? Okay. So I think this is kind of interesting, the next one. Let's say Elizabeth is convicted of one or more counts. What are her possible consequences? In federal court, uh, judges use a set of guidelines as an aid in determining a defendant's sentence. These rules are known as the federal sentencing guidelines. And what they will look at is this table. And what this table consists of is there's two axes. The first one, the vertical axis, is the offense level. And this is how serious the crime is. You know, the more serious the crime is, the greater the offense level. For example, and in the case of a financial crime like wire fraud, the more money you steal or embezzle, the higher the offense level. 
Okay? Now, the horizontal axis is the criminal history of the defendant. If they have prior serious criminal convictions, their criminal history category will go up. Okay? In the case of Elizabeth, I don't find any evidence that she was ever convicted of anything serious, any serious crime. Right? So I think her criminal history category will be number one. So, as you can see, let's say you have an offense level of one and a criminal history category of one, and you see the number zero to six, right? That's the number of sentences that the judge should convict you of, zero to six months. And again, this is a guideline. The judge can use it or he can decide to sentence her to something else, all right? And as you can see, as the offense level goes up, and as the criminal history category goes up, the, the sentence, possible sentence goes up. Matter of fact, the maximum sentence you can get is life. So I'm curious. You guys have been studying Elizabeth. Uh, maybe you think she's innocent. I'm curious. If she's convicted, what kind of sentence do you think she should get? You guys must have some opinion. If you were the judge, what would you sentence her to? Or maybe you'd say zero months, I don't know. What do you guys think? Come on. Sophie? What do you think? A couple of, like, some number of like, years, definitely. OK. Five know, like, years, 10 years? 20 years, maybe? I'm sorry? 20 years? Maybe? 20 years? OK. That's a pretty serious sentence. Someone else? How much? Okay. 20? Okay. How about you guys over there? Five. Five? Okay. I would say 40. 40? Wow. Well, she did bait people out of millions of dollars, so. Okay. All right. There's no right answer. I'm, you guys would be pretty tough on her, it sounds like, though. All right. So, I've come up some, with some rough calculations. I'm, again, I'm no criminal law expert, but I think her offense level would be between 36 and 40, okay? Again, I think she has a criminal history category of one. So the sentence she would be looking at would be within this range. So what that means is Elizabeth, if she's convicted, she could face a sentence of between 188 to 365 months. So that's roughly 15 to 30 years in prison. All right? So, for example, if she's convicted to 30 years in prison, that means she won't get out of prison until she's in her 60s. So, you know, this is very serious for Elizabeth. Questions? All right, now, what does Elizabeth teach us about business ethics? Well, lesson number one, this is no surprise, this is an earth shattering, uh, but ethics start, start with an organization's leadership, right? It starts at the top, right? The firm's leaders are role models for the entire organization. They set the tone and lead by example. For example, on the left is Howard Schultz. He's the former CEO of Starbucks. He was a very ethical leader that led by example. He made an effort to treat his employees well. He provided them with, with, with good benefits. He tried to make sure that he treated his suppliers well and that the suppliers treated their employees well. He tried to lead by example. On the right is Bernie Madoff, who you guys may have heard of. He's a former investment banker who stole billions of dollars from various investors and now is serving a sentence of, I think, 150 years in prison, something like that. And that's obviously the other side of the spectrum. And, you know, since he was such a corrupt and unethical leader, the people within his organization helped him and did the same thing. They helped him with the fraud and perpetuate the fraud. That's why it took several years for him to get caught. Mm -hmm. 
The other lesson, lesson two, other parts of the organization help influence the firm's conduct and should not abdicate their responsibilities. For those of you who aren't familiar with corporations and the way corporations work, this is like a typical structure of a corporation. The shareholders are the owner of the corporation. They appoint the board of directors. The board of directors are responsible for the overall and strategic management of the corporation. They also are responsible for hiring and firing the CEO. So in the case of Theranos, Elizabeth was the chief ex executive officer. She reported to the board. Remember that board I showed you earlier, right? So what happened in the case of Theranos is the board of directors, all those powerful men, they completely abdicated their responsibility, right? They let Elizabeth do whatever she wanted, which is why she picked that board, all right? Typically what boards will do of companies is they will carefully look at the finances of the company, right? They'll form a committee, a finance committee, and they'll look at financial statements of the company and make sure the company is being run right, right? One of the things they'll insist on is something called audited financial statements. And those are financial documents prepared by an outside accounting firm. The accounting firm actually comes into the business and does an audit and looks at all the records and receipts and bills and invoices and confirms that the company's numbers are accurate. The Theranos board never insisted on that documentation. They never looked, took a close look at what Elizabeth did. As a matter of fact, they looked the other way. For example, one of the board members, George Schultz, his grandson worked for Theranos. And as, at a certain point, the grandson became really uneasy with what the company was doing and thought they were committing fraud. So he went to his grandfather, George Schultz, about it and told him about it. His grandfather didn't believe him. And the company found out about this and they sued the grandson to keep him quiet. All right? George Soltz and the other board of directors just looked the other way and let Elizabeth do what she wanted to do. And that's why I think Professor Gardner is right, right? Elizabeth intentionally chose this board of old white men because she could basically seduce them, so to speak, right? They wouldn't raise any tough questions. They wouldn't question her, right? They just let her do whatever she wanted to do. The other reason she recruited that board is they were, most of them were very wealthy, and she got money from them. All right, lesson number three. To foster an ethical organization, the leaders need to outline and communicate their expectations. What do I mean by that? First of all, the expectations need to be expressed in some kind of a mission statement or a code of conduct that you give to all the employees that they have to follow. Next, ethics training should be provided to all employees. That way they understand what is and is not permissible and how to address ethical dilemmas and issues. Third important point is that those that violate the firm's standards should be punished appropriately. Right? You can't let people get away with unethical acts. Last point is that in the case of Theranos, their mission statement didn't refer to any ethical obligations whatsoever. And as far as I can tell, they had no code of conduct. All right? So there was no, nothing in writing to dictate or tell the employees what is permissible and what is not. And that's something you need as a business. Lesson number four is that a company, a firm, should set up appropriate reporting mechanisms. What do I mean by that? They need to provide some kind of mechanism where employees can get confidential advice if they are facing an ethical issue or question or dilemma and report ethical issues. Larger companies oftentimes will have an ethics hotline that employees can call and report an issue or ask for advice. That's what I mean by that. Second point, 
Well, that, I just made my second point. Now, not surprisingly, Theranos didn't have any kind of ethics hotline, right? Otherwise, it would have been ringing off the hook. All right, the last lesson. If you're running an organization, it can be a for-profit corporation or even a non-profit uh, organization, your employee's performance appraisal should include a review of how that individual is doing compared to the firm's code of conduct. You need to give your employees feedback on what they're doing well and what they're not doing well and what they need to improve. And that's very important when it comes to ethics. And those are my lessons. The last point I would make, and this has nothing to do with ethics, someone comes to you with an investment that sounds good, too good to be true. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a good friend or a family member, you should turn and run away. Okay? Thank you for your time.